all for coming and um, Maxime is just uh, switching to the phone in the meantime. Uh, well, we will, you know, to start uh, speaking. And um, in the meantime, I can maybe talk a little bit about our guest speaker. Um, so you know um, a little bit about who uh, will be talking today. Uh, Maxime, like Dr. Uh, Maxime Rigaud, he is a postdoctoral researcher in biomolecular archaeology at the Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich at the Department of Pre- and Proto-History and at the, the uh, University of Britannia Sioux uh, at the Temos Laboratory. And he's also an assistant lecturer in archaeological science at the University of Tübingen in Germany. And his research interests lie in the characterization of ancient organic substances and their systems of production during pre- and proto-history in Western Europe and also the Mediterranean area. So uh, in addition, he identifies biomaterials for example, animal, adipose fats, dairy, beehive products, uh, fermented uh, beverages, plant oils, tars, resins. Um, and his work also targeted at investigating the procurement strategies, the transformation processes and the areas of activity in which organic substances were used. Um, and different in this different fields of research, um, are his combining including archaeology, analytical chemistry, experimental archaeology, spatial analysis, and more recent ethnoarchaeology uh, at the French Polar Institute program ETAPAS. And he's also currently involved in the ERC project, uh, Food Transforms, Transformations at Food in the Eastern Mediterranean Late Bronze Age and the regional program Late Ages, uh, Archaeology of Dairy Products in Proto-History Brittany. And before these current positions, he obtained his master's in molecular chemistry. And, um, I'm sorry, I was checking in between, <laughs> in molecular chemistry at the University of Rennes and a PhD in prehistory at the University of Nice, Sophia Antipoli, France. Um, and his PhD research focused on the management of plant resins, tars, and organic uh, fossil substances in the northwestern Mediterranean region during prehistory. Um, so, uh, yeah. It will be really interesting. Then he completed the three years of postdoctoral training at the University of Tübingen in Germany, where his work focused mainly on paleo dietary and consumption practices during the early Iron Age and Central Europe um, times. So, uh, Maxime, are you able, are you back? Um, do you see the invite now? Um, let's see. If it's working now. Right at
Um, yeah, I don't know what to do anymore. Um, Maxime, could you give us any feedback if you, if you, uh, what, if you're on your phone now, um, if you, um, if you can see the notification, um, so you can come up to the stage and speak with us. Okay, great. So do you see on top of the screen either a green notification where it gives you the option to come to the stage to speak? Or if you click on your own profile, if you see an invite to speak? Okay, that's pretty much impossible. So um, can you click on your own profile picture, please? So next to your uh, name, uh, where you wrote the text, it, this message in the chat, Maxime Reggio, um, you, there's a symbol, MR, like a round symbol. If you click on that, your own profile um, pops up. And then all the way on the bottom, there should be invite to speak or an invitation to speak. Uh, and if you click on that, you should be joining the stage. Did you click on that uh, invitation? Um, LT, I'm gonna make you moderator. Can you could you try to invite uh, Maxime maybe to speak? Or Z, if you want to come up, um, could you could you try maybe LT is is away from the phone for a minute? Thank you so much, Z. Sure. Um, so maybe I'm it's inviting. Yeah, I just sent an invitation. I also followed Maxine. Oop. Look. Yeah, that worked. Perfect. Yay. Welcome. Thank you so much for being patient. And um, yeah, welcome uh, to the stage. So you should have a little microphone symbol. Yep, yeah. there you go. Sorry. You? <laughs> so it was the, only the first time that I could see the green invitation. I don't know why. Well, it worked. Uh, maybe because I, it, uh, maybe because I followed. I don't know, but it worked, so we're here. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, bravo, bravo. Thank you so much, everyone, for um, yeah, and thank you, Maxime, for not giving up. Uh, <laughs> I, I was close to giving up. I have to admit because. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we would say that for persistence, right? We love that <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. So yeah, welcome. I kind of already talked uh, about you, where you work, where you went to school and about your PhD thesis a little bit in the meantime. Um, usually we do like a brief interview. Um, just let me ask like a question how, uh, that we usually ask uh, before we start, and this is okay. how did you come to work like in archaeology, and how did you discover that this is something you want to do with your life? Um, oh. really interesting. Yeah. Um, actu actually, the um, I come for in archaeology um, because I wanted to do some different kind of research. I was interested in different kind of things, uh, natural science, uh, history um past society uh, sociology and actually archaeology is one of the rare uh, option when you can integrate every kind of field of research and i i i have to admit that i love it to integrate different kind of because actually i'm i use natural science for archaeology and uh, i think it's one of the rare actually yeah one of the rare topic where you could uh, work with every kind of specialist from humanities natural science together and combine every kind of research so that that's uh, the idea why i came there 
That sounds that wonderful. Sounds wonderful. <laughs> and I can relate to that. Uh, and I think almost everyone probably that is here can relate to that because, you know, we cover so many different areas of science. Yeah. And uh, that you get to do that in your everyday work life. That's wonderful. So that's a great answer. Thank you for giving us that. Um, yeah, that, that background information about you. And if you would like to start with your presentation, everyone has access to the PDF. So if you um, can just uh, mention when you switch to the next slide, that's uh, very helpful. And okay, sure. This is yours, thank you. Okay, um, so but uh, in the first slide, um, I would like to first to thank you to to invite me and sorry for the beginning of this <laughs> of this talk and uh, but finally we succeed uh, to manage it. Um, so as I was beginning to tell you, I'm uh, a specialist that we call the nowadays in biomolecular archaeology. So that means that in the study mostly uh, ancient lipids uh, and other kind of products from plant metabolism, let's say. And I work uh, generally on the use of organic product uh, during the last say, last six millennium BC in uh, Western Europe, Mediterranean region, so including Egypt, and also until uh, recently uh, in Southern Caucasus. And so that's why for those which are not so familiar with this field of research, I will first uh, present an introduction to the potential that can offer this kind of study of biomolecular markers in archaeological context and uh, how they can provide insight into um, several practices in ancient societies. And of course, I will focus the talk uh, on the body care and especially on the embalming practices. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the next slide, so slides two. I just wanted to show you that um, the um, study of organic resources in archaeological context has long been uh, been challenging. Uh, Indian materials that we discover in archaeological context since Paleolithic periods and until the days um, was uh, limited during a long time to uh, the study of bio and geo resources that can be characterized through their specific morphology. Uh, for example, uh, when you find ceramics, flint tools, uh, etc. But also, uh, when I say specific mor morphology, also including at microscopic scales. Uh, here you have in this picture some biomaterial that we can recognize through uh, at microscopic scale, like pollens, charcoals, uh, phytoliths. Um, so we can identify in this way. But uh, uh, it's just after, so next slide, sorry, slide number three. It's after some big development in chemical techniques, especially in the 80s, and more especially the development of the biomolecular archaeology, that we were able to characterize some ancient biomolecules. And thus, um, a wide range of biological resources that have lost all their morphological characteristics have been revealed. And it has um, renewed uh, and completed the data, particularly in the field of food, health, and population mobility from the past society. So here yeah, I show you different kind of um, big molecules which could be, which can nowadays be identified. And my research uh, focus uh, on some biomolecular com component, as I was saying at the beginning, which result from metabolism of legal living organisms. Sorry, and um, in organ in archaeology. This field of research is often called organic residue analysis. Um, so the molecular markers uh, that I study, which are the most common, uh, are the lipids, so ancient lipids, of course, which are highly concentrated in animal fat and oily plants. But uh, we also studied other kind of products of plant metabolites, for example, plant exudates, um, like resins, um, uh, some high volatile a fraction of plants like essential oils, fragrance oils, etc. Uh, and the study of such substance uh, can provide insight in several practices, as I was showing you here, uh, related to food and drinks, uh, but also related to uh, manufacturing techniques of objects and also uh, to the body care in ancient society. Uh, 
So in body care, integrate here unbalancing practices, therapeutic practices, and also cosmetics uh, practices, which could be also um, documented in some context. And beyond the identification of these organic products, uh, we try also to investigate uh, different segment of the lifestyles of uh, past societies when we are looking for the procurement strategy of such products, but also how these products are transformed or how they are um, uh, produced, for example, and which were their uses, which, which kind of functions uh, could have this kind of organic substances, let's say. So in the field, again, of biomolecular archaeology, uh, oh, sorry, I'm uh, in the slide number uh, five. I forget to tell you, <laughs> excuse me. So I'm slide five nowadays, uh, no. Uh, so slide number five. So uh, it, this one with um, what I show in biomolecular archaeology, the different kind of, of uh, substance or molecules which could be used or family. Uh, I, uh, I I looking as I was saying about lipids and what we call resins. Uh, actually, it's kind of terpene and true terpene uh, molecules for uh, people which are more chemists. Um, that is this one that I studied. They are in archaeological context. They are of course not so um, specific as ancient DNA or proteins huh, to in order to identify the genus of animal of plant or substance. And it's also sometimes not so easy to to specify the spaces. But uh, in slide six, uh, if you can see, there is kind of um, interesting things to look for uh, the lipid in archaeological context because they are more resistant. Uh, they have some advantages in archaeological context. How huh? their structures are more uh, so like for for kind of chemistry, let's say. Some carbon-carbon bonds are more resistant uh, um, to, let's say, globally natural degradation. Let's say later what it is um, more specifically, but they are present in more artifacts as uh, ancient DNA or proteins, which are generally related on bones or dental calculus. With some lip lipids, resins, we can also um, they can also be preserved in ceramic vessels. They are trapped uh, or absorbed in uh, in the clay matrix of the vessels, but they are also sometimes found as surface residues. So they could be preserved also like uh, adhesive uh, stuff in some flint tools, but also as free lamps, as you can see in this picture. Really briefly, that's just the example of the uh, and really fast uh, in slide number uh, seven. It's how we use to extract this sample. So as you can see here, we have a uh, ceramic shards. We use a uh, kind of uh, Dremel um, uh, driller. And we are, we, uh, we abrasive, we, we, we sample some powder. So after removing the surface of the vessel, which could be contaminated, we, we sample uh, the layer just above and we get a powder. And this powder is chemically extracted with different kind of uh, solvent and protocols, which are de developed according to the different kind of substance. And then they are generally analyzed through gas chromatography mass spectrometry uh, in order to separate the molecular mixture, which, uh, which could be uh, present and um, provide some uh, structural information of the molecule. The idea is to um, identify several molecules, seven specific biomarkers which can compose the archaeological substance. Uh, slide number eight is also an other kind of protocol uh, that we can uh, use to study the substance which are preserved in dental calculus. That are also uh, could be also interesting. Uh, so it's slide number eight, yeah. Uh, has uh, in dental calculus, you can combine the study of lipids of ancient DNA, ancient proteins, to have a, a nice idea about um, paleo diet, but also uh, uh, past disease uh, or some also technical activities. But in uh, slide nine, uh, I, uh, I wanted to uh, to show some examples of the wide range of raw products from animal or, or implant origin, uh, which could be um, preserved in archaeological context. So we have raw materials. Uh, but also, and what is interesting, we, has, we have some molecules which show uh, the presence of transformed product. For example, um, the, the presence of some vegetable oils or plant oils, which in archaeological context 
could only result it to an extraction processes are they need to be highly concentrated in order to be still detected. Uh, we have also marker of fermented beverages, so showing a biochemical processes by the human, or we have also sometimes marker uh, showing the the cooking or the roasted roast uh, roasting practices of animal fats. Uh, slide 10, I show you a, a kind of molecules that we could detect uh, more or less in an ecological context because the organic substance will not be preserved in the same way uh, according to their molecular composition. For example, um, in the, on the left of the slide, the polyunsaturated fatty acid are generally not preserved in ecological context as um, they are really uh, they could be easily degraded through bacterial activities and oxidation. So generally, we don't detect them uh, in most of the context. It's the same for the high volatile compounds in a lot of contexts like mono and sesquic Japan. They are uh, they are so volatile generally, except on some specific favorable contexts like Egypt, and we will see that later they are generally not so preserved. But after you have some molecules like um, uh, saturated fatty acid from animal fat uh, could be, uh, are quite stable and could be um, preserved a long time. D and triterpen also, which have a stable skeleton mm -hmm. and hydrocarbons, of course. Uh, um, hydrocarbons, um, for example, it's also molecules which are present in meat humans. So you can imagine how stable it is. And we are talking here about uh, million euros sometime. Um, the other things that I wanted to to present you on slide 11 is, of course, you will not have the same preservation according if you have surface residue like free lamps of surface residue on, on tools, or if it trapped or absorbed residue in some vessels of, or in dental calculus. It's, it's of, of course, uh, protected uh, from exogenous uh, contamination and degradation. So we could have more sensible uh, molecules which could be preserved and trapped uh, when they are trapped. And uh, finally, also the lipid are relative tables compared to other biomicromolecules like DNA or proteins. Uh, they still could be submitted to physical chemical parameters linked to the local geology and climatic influence. Um, in rural context also, uh, you could have different kind of degradation. Uh, what we can, what you can imagine, and uh, the, the the all the contexts which have um, which have the most favorable context for bacterial activity and oxidation are the worst. And in the opposite, the best context is one which are when they are reduced. So the best one are generally the arid context, so arid warm like in Egypt, arid frozen like uh, sometimes in Siberia, or water -like context also could be really favorable. So in this context is the best kind of context that we could have for um, um, organic substance in archaeological context. So uh, my field of research can address, as I was telling you, different kind of economy of organic resources, uh, and it involves a wide range of practices. Uh, so that is slide number 13. Sorry, I forget to tell you uh, sometime that. I apologize. So uh, slide four, uh, 13. Um, so um, there is different kind of uh, practices I was telling uh, uh, um, and activities. Uh, here I show you also uh, the information that we can get uh, by studying the food and drinks. So we can study combining the uh, the kind of vessel which were preserved, the consumption practices, uh, some culinary preparation, which are sometimes interesting because, um, as maybe you know, a culinary practices could be also used sometimes as cultural markers. So it could be also interesting to compare uh, some societies through the time or uh, with the neighbors. Um, so we can also uh, have an idea about kind of recipes which could be done. Uh, that is example that uh, what we which kind of molecule that we can still detect in well preserved uh, vessels. Um, some molecular analysis show sometimes a series of uh, three glycerols which could be degraded of the acid glycerols, monoacid glycerol, and fatty acid at the end. And if it's well preserved, like in the slide number fifteen, sorry. Uh, we could have an assemblage of triglycerol, which could be mostly related to some specific product. In this case, dairy product uh, with triglycerol or, or 
uh, small tree soil which are uh, mostly preserved in dairy and not, for example, in uh, adipose fat uh, from ruminant. So with molecular analysis, we could sometimes distinguish, discriminate some animal plant origin if uh, tree acid glycerols are well preserved. But uh, uh, in slide six, uh, um, 16, sorry, uh, I show you also uh, another method because sometimes tree acid glycerols are not preserved to the time. They could be, uh, in some context, they will be degraded and degraded into uh, fatty acids. And when we have just fatty acid, it's in archaeological context, it's quite difficult to associate them with an origin uh, via, via the normal molecular analysis. So in this case, we use the, the molecular isotopy of carbons of two molecules, the palmitic acid and the steric acid, uh, which has the most important uh, molecules in uh, fatty acid in, the, in animal products, for example. And the way that these two fatty acids are biosynthesized and, co and conducted in the different animals provide different isotopic ratio, ratio, sorry, and then we can distinguish between animal fat from different category, between protein fat, ruminant fat, marine products, dairy, etc. Uh, yeah, that is the most category. And just to conclude in slide uh, 17 on the, on, the, on the cuisine and cooking practices, uh, what is interesting is sometimes when uh, ancient society cooked marine product or terrestrial annual, animals, they create new markers. Uh, in the case with marine products like fish, uh, and they create, uh, for example, in this slide 17, you can see uh, the, 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 the production of acylphenyl alkalinoic acid, which are much more stable as the polyinsaturated acid. In this case, we can see that people was consumed some marine product, but it was cooked. We have the same products which could um, happen when terrestrial animals are roasted and cooked. You create some specific ketones, which are showing also that people were grilled or cooked extremely intensively uh, some animal fat. So that gives you also an idea of a kind of um, transformation of, uh, of, um, of products, of cooking and uh, of food products, sorry. And just before to, to arrive to uh, the embalming practice, practices, I wanted also uh, in slides 18 uh, to show you also another kind of information that we can provide in ancient societies. It's um, investigated organic products that are used to manufacture uh, objects and that are connected with different technical activities. Uh, organic products, organic materials could be used to like a glue, to fix, to haft some tools, but also to produce some vessel in the vessel production. They could be used to seal some vessels, to decorate some vessels, uh, also for the maintenance of the reparation of products. So it's all a kind of uh, economy of recycling that we can also sometimes um, uh, document, document, sorry. Um, so that is the idea of also all this technical aspect. And what is maybe more interesting uh, today uh, for us is um, the study of uh, this kind of product for body care and dental care. It's often difficult to show it in archaeological, uh, in archaeological uh, context as this uh, substance could be used, uh, the same substance could be used for different kinds of functions. And um, for example, uh, dairy products or uh, bee products are used in, uh, in the food, but also in, meat, in therapeutic properties, etc. in the past. Uh, in, uh, in prehistory, we have, for example, for uh, dental care, the presence of chewing gum, uh, which could be beeswax chewing gum. Beeswax were also used to, to, um, for, uh, to, um, to treat a decay tooth. It was the same with birch bark tar or, or some kind of resin, which was shown to for uh, dental hygiene. So we have different kind of evidence of that. And of course, we have uh, uh, the protection of the body. Of, uh, it could be cosmetic or it could be unbalming. These products again, and that is also uh, interesting for unbalming, could be used for ritual practices. We have the well-known balms in burial chambers and uh, in Egypt, but we ha we don't have to forget that this kind of uh, uh, substance could be used like uh, in answers burners in other kind of uh, contexts, uh, like in uh, Neolithic, in big 
kind of uh, funeral chamber in northwest of France. We have also some resin and tar which were burned in funeral context. So now I will uh, really uh, enter to the our Egyptian history uh, and with a kind of introduction about uh, really brief uh, history of embalming practices in ancient Egypt. I'm not uh, first an Egyptologist, so I will not uh, enter so in details. But first, uh, kind of reminder, what is a modification or embalming practices? So the idea is that it's uh, practices which are performed by specialized and learned persons. Uh, which they could be called ritualist embalmers. And, uh, oh, sorry, I forget to tell you, I'm uh, slide 21. Uh, excuse me. Uh, if I maybe if I forget to 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 tell you, uh, just remember me that because I continue to talk and I forgot to say that I changed the slide. So I'm in the twenty first. Um. Uh. So yes. Um. So these uh embalming practices were actually uh interesting for two purposes. They are ritual pro processes first, of course. We are in funeral context, but they are also chemical process. And from a chemical uh, perspective, uh, the practice involved from simple natural preservation through desiccation um, via proto-embalming treatment during prehistoric time to a sophisticated pharaonic procedures of anthropogenic desiccation, so using natron. You can also ha have uh, in this procedure exaceration, evisceration, and the use of antibacterials, antifungals, barrier materials, and fixatives. So these preservation procedures, which will take up to 70 days to complete, ensure to the transformation of a vulnerable body to a durable mummy. That is the idea. Um, and of course, we have a lot of ritualized act and uh, recitation of liturgy texts, which um, come uh, in the same processes. So uh, mixing all the time together, this kind of chemistry uh, practices and this kind of ritual practices together. Uh, in ancient Egypt, of course, the both magic and science were not separate stuff. They could also uh, be linked together and associated together all the time. A brief history about product which were used for embalming. Um, it actually, uh, what is interesting, the first uh, embalming proxies are detected in Egypt already in prehistoric period. So I'm slide 22 now. And we have the first uh, evidence of uh, mummies which were embalming in uh, 4300 uh, BC in Egypt. Uh, and at the beginning, was most, uh, the substance which were used was mostly fat and oil. So it could not be so precise, uh, unfortunately. So it could be a plant oil or animal fats, which were used and quite interesting to um, to, to, um, to seal uh, the skin and the body from eventual moistures, which could arrive in some humidity context, as we have sometimes uh, in um, in Egyptian terms. We have some, we have still but really rarely uh, some antiseptic substances which could be added. Uh, slide 23. Uh, from the Middle Kingdom, these antiseptic uh, substances are more important and more frequent in the mummification. So we are here in 2000 uh, until uh, 1500 uh, BC. Um, and slide uh, 24, in the New Kingdom, so from uh, 1500 uh, BC, uh, more and more products uh, are um, added in the mummification pro processes. You have in the animal fat and plant oil, which could be used uh, different kind of animal products, could be marine products, fish products, uh, could be ruminant products. In the plant oils, it could be uh, sometimes castor oil, which were detected. And we have uh, also not only conifer byproduct, probably resin or tar, but also sometimes pistachia resin and a little uh, beeswax. And slowly, bitumen was also integrated in, in the embalming. But slide number 25 is mostly from the third intermediate or the late periods. So uh, from 1000 BC until about the Ptolemaic period, so 300 where the band increasingly uh, become more and more complex. 
Uh, we have really often in the bands different kind of product associated, sometimes three, four, five different kind of substance used to to uh, to use the bands. Once again, really often the base of animal fat, plant oils, but also conifer product, a large amount of bitumen, pistachio resin, and beeswax, which are more and more uh, integrated together to have more and more complex uh, bands. And uh, in slide 26, it's just to show you also that the the embalmers could uh, produce some uh, balms, uh, different kind of balms in the same mummy according to um, to the different area of the bodies. Here you have uh, an examples uh, where, for example, uh, the uh, left side of the uh, mummies, uh, uh, some bitumen were used in the left side and the mummies not in the left, and you have some time. Uh, specific, uh, more specific mixtures according if you are um, unbalanced the, the hand, unbalanced the head, uh, some torso uh, area, etc. Uh, in slide 27, uh, I show you also an example uh, from literatures, which show also that you could have difference between the status of the people, so it could be social status of, of the people, but also the individuals. So between adults and children, for example, as you can see here, children were generally not so, uh, uh, the, the bands used for the children are generally simpler than from the adults. So mostly fat oils plus one other products, could be beeswax, resin or something else. The adults are sometimes three, four uh, different kind of bands, uh, a substance in their bands, sorry. And in the slide 28, it's also, also sometimes a, a, a gender difference. Uh, it's, it's difficult to do that because we have not so much mummy and sometimes we cannot say exactly if, uh, if it was a male or female mummies. But uh, what's up here, it's also that the male uh, uh, mummies have the band more complex, so there are uh, sometimes three or four ingredients in the mummification. It's generally less for the female mummies, but, uh, and that we need more um, analysis. The, uh, so, uh, some products seems to be dedicated more frequently for the female mummy, like pistachio resin. Pistachio resin uh, seems to be more related to the female. So you could also in the embalming pr procedure have distinction between gender, status, uh, the age, etc. Um, and the problem that we had until now, uh, it's uh, that we could just identify some uh, individual mummies, which Will not be compared with uh, a large um, a large part of the society. So we will have different mummies from different areas, from different periods, and it was difficult to uh, to study really uh, in one period what were the real embalming practices for a large part of the societies. And um, if you go to slide twenty nine, uh, the that it's uh, I show you here the different kind of information that we can uh, have about uh, embalming substance and embalming workshop uh, to know. So we can document it, them with three kind of sources. The first one is the archaeological deposit, the embalming cache. You have in the left one of the uh, largest embalming cache, which were also recently discovered. Um, so that show all the pottery and all the material which were used for the embalming. In the middle, you see the all, the really important sources are the written and picture sources. So with these sources and especially the papyri, we have an idea of glo a global idea of what was the rules of embalming at different periods and for different uh, peoples. But papyri are not present in all uh, the periods. We have some in the New Kingdom. We have some later. Um, but for example, in the, during the late period, we have nothing. Um, and the last uh, information that we can get about the embalming is when you study and what was done to know the mummy itself. So you sample uh, the mummy, and you can also identify different kind of uh, bands which were used. And uh, slide thirty. Uh, you can, uh, you can, uh, what was really impressive with this discovery of the embalming facility at Saqqara is we can reshape our knowledge uh, about this understanding of ancient mummification because it's extremely rare to identify an embalming workshop. 
So this unbalancing workshop was excavated by my colleague Ramadan Hussein from the University of Tübingen. Uh, it's a non-burning workshop that, uh, which were dated from the 26th dynasty, so about, um, 7th century and 6th century BC. And, uh, this unbalancing workshop, uh, so quite recent, so late period for Egypt, were, uh, uh, located close to, um, some old pyramid, this one from the King Yunus, the small one, the not beautiful one, and not so far from the Jeza one. That was quite interesting because it's a period where the Egyptians decide to come back to the early periods to try to create a link in terms of Egyptian identity, identity with the previous Egyptian stuff. So they create new uh, funeral complex close to the first pyramids. And what was really ex exceptional to um, in this um, uh, discovery of my colleague Ramana Hussein in so slide 31st, it's we have a non-balming workshop uh, and it's may probably one of the the only one in the world where you have different facilities and especially a non-balming room which were underground and that is quite unique G generally you have the unbalming workshop which are up above ground uh, where it's written ibu structures here you have the ibu structure with some activities which are above and some which were uh, at 13 meters deep the unbalming room and this uh, unbalming room was really exceptional because um, there they has an arch 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 sorry, architectural design that will, could help to reduce the hills uh, risk of the ancient embalmer from microorganisms by means that uh, we found some ventilation systems. We uh, the, this room has some hair tunnels running through the rooms. Uh, so it was connected to massive networks of other sub, uh, subterranean uh, tunnels. There are two channel drainage systems for bodily fluids. Um, so good to uh, relieve the uh, evisceration. And we have also uh, identified large pottery vessels, uh, which could be used for um, fumigation sources. So to, for example, to, to reduce um, uh, the bad smell, but also to um, to avoid any insect which could um, have could be related to perturbation of uh, the treatment of the of the days. So that is something quite exceptional because um, it's quite rare to have these things. And me, I could of course investigated the pottery which were uh, identified in this embalming room. So I'm now in slide thirty second. Uh, in this embalming room, we, we, we identified different kind of vessels. I'm a little late, so we'll go a little further, but yeah. Uh, and just so in this embalming room, we found also an embalming cache. And um, slide 33, you can see the different kind of vessel which were discovered. So it was vessels related to uh, embalming. And in each of these vessels, you had some uh, inscription uh inscription in uh in erratic uh, languages and uh which were most uh, the most common in egypt at this period and in this inscription it was um there is different kind of instruction for the mummification so we were lucky to have uh vessels where we are the instruction uh, of uh, embalming procedures and that is extremely uh, rare and we could combine this information to the chemical analysis and the investigation of organic residue which were preserved inside. Uh, slide 34, um, I show you which kind of uh, inscription you could find. So most of the vessels were coming from the embalming room, but I also identified some vessels which were found in burial chambers. So in Saqqara complex, I forget to tell you that first, sorry. You have the embalming workshop uh, above ground and in the embalming room 13 meter dips, but you have also 30 uh, meter dips. You have also burial chambers, different kind of burial chambers with several mummies. And in some some of these burial chambers, we have also uh, some uh, vessels connected to uh, the last deposit for the and the last maybe funeral practices or chemical practices of the mummies just before to close the burial chambers. So, um, slide 35, uh, we could, uh, analyze and extract it. As I was telling you at the big, uh, telling you at the beginning of my introduction, uh, we was extracting some chemicals which could be preserved in, uh, in the vessels. 
So we uh, chemically extracted different kind of vessel with some motion. One is written was written to wash, the other to make the other pleasant. We have some instruction quite interesting. Also, it, it was used the third days of the mummification for making beautiful the skin. We have also um, substance which were used to the for the treatment of bandage of wrap of the embalming. Some dedicated to the treatment of the head, and also some inscription uh, with the, some gods like uh, Imseti, which are the the god uh, protectors of the liver, or the god Duamutef, which were the god protector of the stomach. Um, and what's uh, so following the different kind of protocol, we identify a large uh, quantity of substance uh, which were composed the the embalming materials. Um, some products were possibly local substance. Uh, for example, animal fats were available in Egypt, uh, castor oil also. But we also identify a lot of imported product, especially from other Mediterranean regions. So product which um, uh, were, are not endemic from Egypt at the beginning. For example, some plant oil type olives could be identified. Olive oils were not really present in Egypt at this period. Uh, bitumen were identified. There are some bitumen in Egypt actually, but what is interesting with bitumen, there is a chemi uh, there are specific chemical signatures according to the geo uh, the, the geologic origin of the bitumen, and the chemical signature of the bitumen found found in Saqqara was the same uh, as the bitumen from the Dead Sea. So it was an imported bitumen which was chosen and not a more local one which were present in Egypt. We are also fond of in particular, interesting, the, we could identify some essential oil or let's say fragrance oils, so um, high volatile uh, markers from plant oils from different kind of products. One from uh, juniper or cypress. Um, unfortunately, we have not enough molecular markers in to distinguish both, but still related to this product. And we have also uh, high volatile markers uh, from cedar. So probably a cedar oil, possibly a tar. That is, are also products which are not available originally in Egypt. So cedar and juniper were also imported probably from Mediterranean area. And uh, we have also identified different kind of resins. Pistachio resin, also imported from Mediterranean area. And uh, more surprising is the presence of some canarium resin. Uh, that we call mostly LME, and a deep terocarpacy resin that we call nowadays uh, mostly damar. And that's both resin are, um, grew, are related to, tr to trees which are growing only in tropical forest. So uh, showing a really uh, long distance importation. That is a substance word that we have identified, but we also identify site 39, sorry, uh, the presence of markers, uh, which could appear following a mixtures, probably resulting to cooking and mixed different kind of products. We have markers which showing that dama were uh, mixed uh, with beeswax or fats, but also other uh, mixtures showing that LME molecules were uh, mixed together with oil or fats. And that is interesting because we identify new molecular markers resulting to a to a transformation, to a production of uh, mixtures. And um, slide uh, 40, what is uh, quite interesting is, of course, we could uh, relate it to the substance and the mixture that we identified to the inscription. And I show you here the examples of uh, the 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 inscription the the substance which were used for the bandage the wrap or the embalm of the mummies and it quite it was quite interesting because we could follow quite the uh, the procedure the recipes not exactly because we don't know exactly uh, how um, the um, the different quantity the ratio of the substance but we found in all the vessels some animal fats uh, generally it's ruminant fats which were identified. In some vessels, they were added with some uh, a fragrance oil of juniper or cypress. After, in most of the vessels, we they added also some elemis and cedar tar and uh, really often uh, plant oil type olives. 
And these big mixtures, which are often present, present uh, uh, um, sorry, identify in the in some red balls, are then um, transfer in some white beaker with heating treatment. And what is funny, we found some heating treatment in the vessels, but also molecular markers showing the heating treatment of these products together. So here we could also document it kind of recipes procedures step by steps. And we could also, um, as I begin to tell you, uh, document different kind of uh, practices related to uh, to, um, for example, to the others, uh, we identified that uh, the inscription on the pottery with the inscription to make the, his order presents are related to a mixture of LME and animal fats. To this inscription to make beautiful the skin are related to a mixture of beeswax and animal fats, which could make sense. Huh? The beeswax are interesting properties for the skin. To wash the body, it was a mixture of uh, fragrance oil of cedar and juniper of cypress. And um, the pottery related to the stomach, possibly in the future to use in the cannabis jar to uh, embalm the stomach. It was mostly a beeswax. And this one uh, related to the organ, the liver, one um, probably to embalm it later in the cannabis jar again, is a mixture of LME and uh, uh, fragrance oil of juniper and cypress. We have also, I will, uh, in uh, slide 42, uh, different kind of uh, mixture used for the head, uh, especially pistachio or resin, which are in Saqqara mostly related to the treatment of the head. Uh, and I will go now directly in, in slide 43 uh, to show you that um, this result suggests uh, interesting um, competence of the embalmers because they use all the time substance which have some uh, specific bio chemical properties. For example, uh, pistachia resin, LME, damars, different kind of oils, bitumen and beeswax have antibacterials, antifungal and odoriferous properties. And thus that help to preserve the human tissue and reduce the imprisoned smell. So totally uh, perfect in this kind of embalming practices. The animal fat, the plant oils and beeswax were also essential ingredients uh, in recipes for the treatment of different body parts. Uh, as well as in ointments used for uh, to moisturize the skin, um, and also we don't have to forget that the, um, this some of these products have hydrophobic and adhesive properties, uh, like the tars, resin, and bitumen, and it's also useful to seal the skin pores, uh, uh, and also again exclude moisture and treat the lining of wrapping. Uh, we have we don't have uh, we we, ha we don't also have to exclude the, the 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 color or the appearance of this product which may, may also be desirable because once again we are in ritual context so it's a lot of properties which could be researched but most of them make sense uh, in this context really briefly uh, because it's already late and I apologize I'm a little too long probably uh one of all the things that we wanted to 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 elucidate it it's uh some inscription which are still um not well um attested by egyptologists and phil philologist uh people especially the word ntu and sefetch which are really related to embalming processes in a lot of texts but which are not clearly identified um, previous Egyptological interpretation was thinking that this was related to mirror and incense, the word NTU. So I'm sorry, I'm slide 44. Uh, that makes sense because uh, in context, be, um, thousand years before Sakura or, or, or earlier, we could have some pictures, sources where there some uh, trees look like mirror tree or incense trees. Uh, but it was not uh, sure. For the Sefej also, um, the previous Egyptological interpretation was not so clear. It was an unidentified un 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 oil, traditionally known as one of the seven sacred oils for the opening of the mouth ritual, but we didn't know more. We analyzed uh, several parts of this uh, with this post inscription, and in slide uh, 45, you can see that in uh, the the pottery with the word dry into you we all the time 
identify the combination of CDR fragrance oil, juniper cerberus uh, oil, and ruminant fat. So it's not exactly mirror and incense. And that would mean that at Saqqara, maybe not later, maybe not uh, previously, at Saqqara, uh, these words are related to this substance. And what is inter interesting, these substances are also really interesting um, odoriferous properties, smell properties. And that could mean that this NTU are it's what one of the, our hypotheses are related to a, a smell product, a different product which could fit with mirror and incense in previous periods, but which are uh, composed of other products later, but keeping the same properties or the same function. For the savage oil, we identify all the time ruminant animal fats, uh, sometimes with juniper, uh, so it's slide 46, sorry, sometimes with ju juniper cypress oils, sometimes with LME. Um, so one of the hypothesis, hypothesis uh, slide 47, sorry, it could be that ruminant fat is used like um, an ointment, an ongon, sorry, to uh, maybe to transfer uh, an odorif property, an odorif, an sorry, uh, substance to the mummy, uh, maybe with uh, again antiseptic and odoriferous properties. And slide 48, um, we also, uh, and to um, quote in my conclusion, um, we also identified some few vessels which were directly in burial chambers. Up to now, it was only the vessels connected to uh, the embalming workshop, so the vessels to produce to, uh, the, the bombs. There we have also some, uh, we could also identify uh, and documented some vessels related to uh, the last uh, deposit uh, uh, with the mummies. And what's quite interesting, we found quasi the same kind of substance in these vessels, except in slide 49 now, the presence of damar and bitumen, which were not identified in the embalming workshop, but only in the vessels close to the mummy, possibly for the last ritual aspect or the last chemicals procedures before to, before to close the, uh, the burial chambers. That, uh, that it's something we could check also when we will investigate later the mummies. And slide 50, uh, to conclude, um, we could show uh, with these studies of an embalming workshop uh, an idea of, uh, of the embalming procedures during the late periods uh, in Egypt, so during uh, the 7th and 6th dynasty. Embalming workshop uh, documentation once again show not only the procedure from one mummies but a large larger uh, number of mummies. So maybe not for all the societies because you need to have uh, to to be part of elite uh, or uh, the more um, to to be um, uh, to be embalmed because it's substance which caused a loss. But a larger part of the society uh, we we get information of a larger space of societies. Uh, concerning these embalming practices. Um, we show and we confirm also that at this period we have a diversification, a complexification of embalming practices. The majority of the substances used at Sakura workshop were imported, many of them from a considerable distance apart. Uh, once again, bitumen identified in Sakura were originate from the Dead Sea, pistachio resin, olive trees, cedar, juniper, cypress, absent from Egypt, uh, grow in different locations in Median basins. Probably they were uh, imported from the eastern part of Mediterranean area because in this period you have strong um, connection between Egypt and the Levant, so eastern part of Mediterranean, nowadays south of uh, Turkey, Lebanon, Israel. And um, and that shows an important trade network which, uh, which includes such kind of uh, products. Uh, and slide 51, uh, what we could also uh, provide like new information about this exchange, uh, it, um, connection with Egypt, uh, with some tropical country. LME could be originated from tropical forests in Africa or tropical forests in Asia. Dama are only present in Southern Asia. So that is something we are, we were not thinking that we could detect some uh, so far away product which were imported in this period, showing that in the embalming uh, in Egypt was an important economical uh, aspect, which include a large uh, scale uh, of exchange. 
and also that you have to to in, to imagine that this embalmers uh, was choosing specific products for specific properties and they were knowing that in from distance country they could find some raw product they could transform them they have kind of chemistry empiric knowledge to uh, to create bands uh, for specific mummification uh, and I thank you for your intention and um, yes I'm it's finished for me thank you so much Maxine. thank you so much for uh, bringing you bringing us through your work with all the different techniques and approaches and um, the type of the different types of insights you can gain from your very systematic and and you know um, analytic approach um, for archaeology it's so interesting um, then also to um, to take you know this analysis to insights of trade routes and world economy from that time it's so impressive and um my first question was did you um when you started analyzing you know all the different findings that way did you predict or were you planning on making you know like world maps of economy and so on or was it something that just came with time and with the gained insights that you that you could you know honestly um we was thinking that we will find some uh, imported product probably from mediterranean area uh because we there is different kind of goods which were traveling since a uh, long time between egypt so we knew that they were a long distance but so far away and so and to identify these tropical resins uh, that was really really surprising that why i was not prepared at all so when we get the results uh, i have first to um, to study analyze a lot of reference of resins find some collection uh, old collection of um, of garden uh, that we have of aging resins to to study really um, this resin to be sure of their, their identification because once again, we use in our um, uh, to compare our archaeological samples some modern reference. So we analyze with the same procedures modern resins. But of course, these resins, their molecular composition change through the times, and we need also to uh, identify some marker of degradation through oxidation, bacterial activities, but also marker which relate are related to human practices, cooking, etc. So um, that way it takes time because before we were definitely sure which kind of resin uh, we um, that we had to study a different kind of uh, uh, of product from different area in the world and to be sure that uh, we were really uh, connected to that so it's something that yeah uh, for this tropical resin it was not expected the other uh, yes what uh, we I didn't also expect it in the presence of some um, uh, high volatile molecules, uh, the sesquiterpenes. This one that we could say that it was more uh, uh, kind of fragrance oils than a resin, because it's marker which are mostly concentrated in the in uh, in the high, uh, high volatile fraction of some plant oil. So people know essential oils. We cannot tell essential oil because we cannot prove that it was cooked. So to produce uh, an essential oil, you have to distillate. It could be possible, but we cannot prove it. So we can extract this volatiles with other things, but we could still say that we have a fragrance oil. So these volatile things, and that it's as I was telling you before, is uh, quite impressive because in generally in archaeological context they are not preserved. In in Egypt it's so well preserved, it's close context, um, so they could keep this kind of markers, and we can just not just say we have conifer products. But we have a fragrance oil of cedar. We have fragrance oil of uh, cupressaceae, so it could be a uh, juniper. So uh, the the levels of uh, of interpretation of the substance were unexpected, and the um, the long distance uh, trade was not also expected. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah, this I think is this is so impressive to see. Um, you know the implications of the work that you did um, 
on a large scale and on a very detailed scale. So um, it's really fascinating. And but that is uh, it's possible because it's Egypt also, <laughs> because we are one of the best contexts uh, of preservation in the world. That that also helps. Yeah, and and this is like the other question I wanted to ask you. You know, what would be the next best one to do this? Like, are there other ancient or you know history contexts that have at least a c close enough, well preserved, um, preserved stuff. I don't know it because it, it can be from <laughs> everything, right? From food to, you know, uh, from I, yeah. I think I think outside of Egypt is difficult. You have probably placed in the world uh, with similar uh, climates of Egypt, which could be interesting. But after you need that uh, this. Ancient society uh, have produced some ceramic vessels with different different kind of food. So um, in Egypt also you have a kind of um, uh, knowledge expertise of a lot of uh, things that also are interesting um, because they are used and they ha they are they are, they, are, they they use also. It's not every kind of society uh, which uh, which could develop so large. Um, uh, action systems, let's say, or uh, trades. Um, so um, for the preservation, you could have uh, after this kind of uh, information globally, it will be maybe difficult in our context. But as yes, once again, dry and warm contexts are absolutely interesting. After there is um, other context uh, where I was quite surprising about the preservation. It's um, more, let's say, uh, in uh, cli cli more um, not so dry context, but if the soils, the sediment are extremely acidic, really acid sediment, it's quite good because um, it's not good for the bones, but it's good for organic residue because the the bacterial activity are less important. And when I was working in southern Caucasus, um, in some context we have really acidic context, and we could also have really well preserved materials. It's not the level of Egypt, but we could find that. The only place where it will be all the time dif be difficult to work is tropical area because tropical area is the, is the context where there is more and more bacterial activities and uh, will, um, the, the, the organic residue will be totally uh, degraded. But maybe, I don't know, uh, in, in America continent, uh, maybe in area uh, in the north of Mexico, south US, uh, you should have similar um, condition for preservation. That, so could be interesting to have possibly in the future uh, uh, investigation showing uh, well preservation. Yeah, and, yeah I was thinking, and I was thinking in the terms of maybe ancient China, I know we had a oh. while ago, you know, about metallurgy and how uh, different recipes of metals and kind of... Yeah. Yeah, that also kind of alluded to the the governmental structures and trading in in China. Mm. But, yes, um, uh, absolutely. There there are some uh, uh, first article was showing also early evidence of kind of um, of trade routes with uh, also such kind of materials, uh, LME and incense resin, which could have traveling ice later. Huh? It's uh, uh, it's uh, uh, AD, so it's uh, I think it's the early Middle Age, but uh, there were not enough investigation, and of course, maybe not the south of China or the place where it's more tropical, so close to Vietnam or some uh, area, but all the um, area in China where it's more arid. That could, yeah, I, I'm sure that uh, it could, should be wonderful huh? to study there. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. I wanted to give other people a chance to ask questions. Um, and then, you know, I wanted to check with you about, you know, the time you still have after uh, checking uh, because, yeah, we plan for an hour. I don't know if we have time, but I'm not sure if you have time. So, um, LT, did you have a question, Z or Victoria? Thank you. Well, uh, this is Z. I just uh, would like to you know, say thank you um, 
for the presentation. Uh, it was excellent and the content was uh, just riveting and um, outstanding visuals to, to go by. I, I don't have a question. I just really want to thank you and thank uh, the Science Society and everybody who uh, stuck around like uh, Bravo. So that's it. This is the I'm done speaking. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, and um, please uh, just flash your mics or um, submit uh, questions in the chat. I, I have a few more notes of questions. So, uh, uh, Maxime, do you have a few minutes maybe? Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. And um, the I know we alluded a little bit to that. Um, but do you like a question that I had written down uh, from from a person that submitted a question was um, if you could elaborate on the potential social economic implication of the the non local organic substances um, that could you even make basically assumptions on the origin of where the substances are from and how basically the structures were there to be able to basically trade with Egypt. Um, so yeah, assumption we can say uh, we can propose a lot with them. Um, so if you go, if you want to go in the slide fifty one uh, to to this other. Um, I propose different way uh, based on the uh, location of the raw product, but uh, we know that especially uh, since the late Bronze Age, so since um, uh, let's say uh, the second part of the second millennium BC, uh, Egypt were really present in the eastern part of Median area, so uh, nowadays Lebanon, Israel, and there are some kind of Egyptian colony there. We know that there were strong exchange importation. So this product, for example, nowadays uh, in what we call Levant, the Levant, all these cedar products production, uh, all these uh, juniper, cypress, all these pistachio resin were probably uh, produced or harvested in this area. Uh, once again, was society which have strong relations. Sometimes it was really Egyptian uh, people, in uh, not anymore in the period of Saqqara, but before Egyptian colony, we have some Egyptian material which are present in this area. So we know that there was some uh, trade um, uh, uh, place uh, within that. So that is definitely something we we can propose. Uh, co connect, uh, co considering the, um, the tropical resin, uh, LMEs and Derma, which could both come from uh, so southeastern uh, Asia, could come f uh, could, uh, well not probably directly imported. So they should have probably some intermediary uh, population or um, um, uh, trader. Uh, no, sorry, I forget the word. But yeah, there were some intermediate people probably. So they could have two ways to arrive uh, to Egypt from, let's say, uh, southern Asia. We know that there were probably uh, other uh, food products and uh, goods which could come from from India. So through India and after through uh, the sea, uh, using the and in the source of um, Arabic penis, uh, peninsula, they they could have some um, tr trade routes which uh, were known already at this period. So it's not impossible through the sea. Uh, at the end of this period of Saqqara, um, there, there will be the kind of Persian invasion. Uh, so it's not also impossible that we have a territorial route uh, through India and through uh, the what have appeared to be the Persian Empire, which arrived uh, uh, after. So you could have uh, both, uh, and um, uh, and that could be uh, the different kind of route which could have so between different uh, exchange system area. So. Uh, different possibility. What is important to to integrate as once again, as it's important product, they are valuable products. Uh, so of course it should be expensive. 
they choose this specific product. They could also have something more local resins, for example, some frankincense or mira, which are present in Arabic Peninsula, which are close there to Egypt. They choose other products, so they knew that they ha they knew th that they have this product, these resins with specific properties, and they wanted this one. So they have this access, maybe with intermediate people. They choose this product, and as it was uh, far away, uh, but still important in embalming workshop, uh, it was something uh, important, and not for all the people of the um, uh, all the people of the society in Egypt. And what is interesting, actually, in Saqqara, I'm talking about the embalming workshop to embalm the mummies which are in the burial chambers uh, in 30 meter dips, but above. We have, we identify also some mummies from more simple peoples, which were actually not uh, really embalmed, but still be well preserved because we are in Egypt context. And they, and people knew that in, in this embalming workshop, there was kind of ritual aspect and people wanted to provide, to, to, to use this kind of funerary services. So they, they put somebody uh, um, uh, close to this context to use all the ritual aspects. And these ones are not so well uh, embalmed, or sometimes have no embalming uh, procedures. If you go uh, in the funeral chamber, you have different kind of quality of mummies, maybe not with the same embalming stuff. So we found different products. Probably not all of the people, according to the status, have the access of all the products. Maybe the it's kind of assumption the middle rich could have access to uh, well, uh, easily imported product from Mediterranean area like cedar products something like that. Maybe the damar and the LME was not for every people, so, but that we will uh, maybe um, confirm it uh, when we could directly uh, study uh, the bones of the different mummies according to the status of the mummies. That does really, that does really um, thank um, you for thank you. that answer. And I'm trying to invite uh, Marina uh, to speak. She, I invited her as well. So perhaps oh, uh, that works. she's up. <laughs> LT, in the meantime, did you have a question? I do, I, okay. I do. Please thank you, ahead. Maxim. Uh, it was a it was a lot of information, but what my question has to do with, uh, yes, it's expensive, so not everyone, um, only maybe very like very rich people, but mm -hmm. uh, my question has to do with slide number twenty five, you showing that uh, like there is the differences in the children versus adult, so I wonder, even a whole family, so what's the explanation? You know, if the family is rich, so I, you imagine that their kids, maybe even their pets, probably are getting this practice. But the, what you find is not right. Now the thing is, um, um, with this example from colleagues uh, um, who summarize a lot of in uh, on embalming studies, um, it was just an average uh, uh, studies about all kind of uh, children uh, uh, which were. Uh, the, the embalming practice of children which were analyzed and the adults. The problem is uh, with this slide of 34, it gives you an information that you could have this tension between adults and children, but here is the average of all the adults of these parents and all the children of these parents. Of course, if it's a children of a rich family and uh, are not so rich family, etc., uh, maybe you will not have the same. Uh, well, I think. To be unbound in ancient Egypt with different kind of substance, you should have already um, uh, high social status because it costs a, a minimum. You need to pay also the embalmers, uh, the ritual. So already to be unbound is not for every po people probably. After yes, the quality I, I, of embalming uh, could also uh, increase according to uh, to the status in the society more as related. But um, that is the problem that we have. That is tense trends that my colleague could found and that it has to be refined according to the context, the periods and the status. All right, thank All right. you. Thank you. Nine. Thank you. Uh, Marina, uh, Marina, did you have a question? Welcome. 
Thank you. Um, Maxim, your presentation has been great. So thank you so much for that. Thank you, Katrina, for facilitating this. LTZ and Victoria for um, providing the support that was needed. Um, I just had a quick question. Um, my question was in regards to when you are looking at these economies and looking at like the trade of these products, what historians are you um, kind of like dating or working back through? Because I heard you kind of um, mention that there might be trade routes between the Indian subcontinent and um, the Arabian Peninsula. But um, I think a little bit of confusion for me because um, you referenced India, but India doesn't exist back then. So it's like a little bit of like, I just was trying to understand what um, groups would have been a part of this, what empires at that time. And maybe if I was to cross-reference what historians you were looking into, it might make it a little bit easier for me to understand. Um. Yes, sorry. Of course, I should uh, of course mention um, that uh, when I say in, uh, in India, uh, yeah, uh, nowadays India, of course. Uh, uh, honestly, I will I will not be able to answer you uh, to uh, uh, because I'm not at all specialist, uh, and as I was not expected uh, to find uh, some product from so far away, I'm not at all spe specialist uh, of. Um, of this region of the world in these periods, but there are some. Um, the, the, we know that there is uh, after later the the Indus civilization, uh, which uh, appear, which have a lot of uh, um, kind of uh, different kind of uh, development of knowledge and uh, technology, who has a lot of um, contact with the Mesopotamian uh, countries, uh, uh, not countries, Mesopotamian. Uh, societies let's say like that um so of course uh, uh it's um it, it's uh, just uh, talking about the regional area um i prefer not to say more because i'm not at all specialist over that but uh, um there was different kind of society we know that in this uh it's not so well known but we know that in the south of arabic peninsula there are already some kind of uh, anthropo uh, trade anthropo which were existed uh and uh, later we will much more develop with kind of also the in some incense road um the egyptian documented the country of poon also which could be also uh possibly the the south uh, related to the south of the arabic peninsula um but uh i, I i'm not uh, at all specialist on uh, this period first i'm uh, mostly a specialist on mission region I have to go to Egypt with uh, more closely with these studies, but um, honestly, um, I, I cannot tell you. Uh, what I, I we know that there is different kind of uh, society in the Levant, uh, which are well developed in the Iron Age. Uh, we know that there are contacts uh, with uh, India. I mean, India, the geographic uh, region. Exactly, which kind of uh, civilization society? I cannot answer. Okay, I was just okay, curious. Was just curious. That. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. No, no, that's okay. Um, are there any historians that you have come upon while um, kind of being in this research that you found interesting and maybe did not include in your research because that wasn't the scope of your research, but you might have just come upon names or um, particular like books that seemed like they would be interesting but not necessarily pertaining to your research just curious not don't feel compelled to answer either uh about sorry can you uh, you would like to like i sorry i didn't hear at least uh, hear so good your question can you repeat? no problem um so i think when you're doing this kind of research there's always like a little bit of interest that starts to develop in like you know these areas and i think as you're like compiling the research there's sometimes research um sometimes like things that may have come to the forefront um but didn't seem so relevant to your research and so what i'm asking is like have you come upon any um historians that you thought were interesting and just haven't had a chance to really read or haven't had a chance to really investigate further um just curious and not necessarily asking 
to grill you or anything. I was just more of a curiosity. Okay, about the society of this period from, for example, uh, the Levant or, or India or something like yeah, that? Yeah, well, from the Levant to, like, I think that period is very interesting. So I'm just curious. Yeah. Uh, but there, there is a uh, yeah several uh, a lot of uh, research uh, uh, Iron Age and uh, uh, late Bronze Age. So um, yeah, I can't tell you in mind uh, which kind of one, but yeah, there's a large literatures because they are the the well uh, let's say especially in uh, in the Levant in Israel they are the most archaeological period which are. Um, studied uh, from the late Bronze Age to the early Iron Age, um, so all the archaeological uh, contexts are well investigated nowadays. Um, I have nowadays a, a student who uh, from <laughs> from uh, from Israel who, has, who is working on the, um, on this kind of context. Uh, if you write me, I can give you a kind of summary of literature or books if you pre if you would like. Yeah, if you write me. If you write me, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'll, do absolutely. I'll do that. Yeah, thank you so much for those questions, uh, Marina. Um, and kind of my last question would be, well, what does the future that you kind of are excited about that you are working on, if you could give us like, a tiny peek into your work future that would that you know wouldn't compromise any publication or anything that you're planning that would be wonderful thank you um yes so now i'm working uh, actually in the publication about food and drinks importation in egypt <laughs> um and uh, so not uh, so i was telling you i'm not looking only about embalming uh, products so but also in food and drinks and um so we will try to uh, to be to be that soon that we have um, transport on fora which were imported to egypt and with product from different areas also in the world so mostly related to the food and drinks so just to complete in these biological resources what we could have and uh, yes uh, the future research that I, con uh, I will continue is um, also to to continue with the previous person who was talking to me it's to continue to to study more globally um from the final bronze age so the the second millennium the last uh, the second part of second millennium what's happened in eastern uh, mediterranean area from Egypt to nowadays uh, Turkey. Uh, so, and also what's happened with the contact with Mesopotamia, with uh, the Levant, with Egypt, and with the Aegean world. So it's a period of a, a strong exchange and, um, uh, and recent relationships. And the idea is to look with how this biological resource could be, um, be integrated or used in this kind of exchange. So it could be, once again, um, products that I, use, I I call not only embalming products because they could be used for therapeutic properties or other kind of body care properties, but also food and drinks, etc. So that is the in the in the future. So try to continue to do that in Egypt, but also again in relation with all the Eastern Mediterranean area. Yeah, that's really, yeah, interesting. That's really interesting. Do you think, do you think the preserved the materials, materials are from, are from also everyday, also everyday people? people. Sorry. Um, if the preserved material are what? Uh, also from uh, also like from everyday like people, everyday. not just you know important um, figures of history. Um, you know the majority of people. I think. Do we know a lot um, a lot about everyday life from like the majority of the population, or do you think? For now, we just know a very small. Yeah, the the, yeah. the archaeologists uh, have a lot of information already of daily life of uh, of these people. We know also with some uh, botanical rest or bones rest, which kind of animals products, which kind of uh, plant product they was consumed. But uh, we don't know uh, how they could sometimes how they could be transformed, which kind of recipes cuisine they were doing. With kind of mixture and how how they were consume them. Um, we are also studied the 
it's a period where the grape wine was uh, more and more uh, present in the region of the world. Who was drinking grape wine? Who were producing that? Who were exchanging that? Olive oil began also to be produced and imported, exported, sorry. So there is all this uh, aspect of, uh, of the trade. We can also identify some transport amphora. So amphora which were used to be transport and to be export or import. Um, so that is information that we can um, provide like an additive, additional information. We know already a lot about um, uh, uh, which kind of uh, yeah cuisine, kind of cooking practices, uh, not cooking practices, but cuisine, but not so um, not so clear and and also the the way are uh, the people are uh, this decide to 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 use such products and ingredients such kind of uh, uh, cereals more or less uh, sometimes it's related to the climate to the environment sometimes it's cultural practices so that is something that we can also provide a little more information yeah, that yeah, is really, really exciting, and I'm looking forward to read that um, publication. I don't know why, but I love, um, I don't know, imagining how people used to live and uh, how how their lives were, and um, and I, I think we can learn a lot about it. Do you think we can make just one last? Question. I'm sorry, <laughs> I keep asking. Yeah, sure. But do you think we can? You know, we. We make so many assumptions about what is healthy for us, especially when we talk about food and lifestyle mm -hmm. and how we, we then claim, yeah, people used to eat this way and people used to do this and that, work more, work less, sleep more, sleep less. Do you think you can, with your research, um, what do you think about that? Is Are most claims out there? pretty silly or are they actually based on your findings because i think you could contribute a lot to that discussion now the, the thing is the, uh, in prehistoric context we we have not all the text so we have not the the high levels of the real consumption we know what they could consume after the quantities how it was uh, mixed uh, it's it's a little uh, more difficult. Uh, and we have also, uh, according to the period and the context, we have some taboo also, like nowadays with some religion, but it was already possible in some, in some periods. So there is so parameters that we sometimes we are not true. Uh, so that it's, I, I guess it's quite difficult. What we can uh, maybe say and look, it's, um, for example, in, um, in uh, in late Bronze Age, we see kind of uh, uh, in Eastern Mediterranean, we see already kind of globalization of the of the food which were consumed. So uh, it's something which uh, appears slowly to have the same kind of ingredients, the same kind of food products that which are which are still known nowadays begin to arrive in this period. So that is quite interesting. After for the ill sea things, um, I don't know. Uh, it's difficult because we uh we don't know the ratio of the product the uh that in the historical period you have much more information because they can say how, how much they could consume I, I say also the opposite the wine or something like that or something what is uh, maybe interesting for nowadays um uh, if if we come back to the embalmings um if the product the natural product that they use the mixtures of fats beeswax uh for for the skins, some kind of resins, some kind of fragrance oils. That could be interesting. Also, nowadays, I'm working in collaboration. That's also one of the futures with some um, uh, dermatologists, which are looking for treatment of the of the skins uh, to find other kind of natural products, which could be interesting. Uh, the wax is already, uh, beeswax is already used, but which kind of product we could create. Uh, also, the um, uh, legis medicine, uh, can we say that in English, legis or this medicine? No. Uh, the um, legis, can we say that of in, in English? Yeah, yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. legis uh, medicine. Uh, also, are interesting to use also new chemicals. Uh, it's, not, it's not so easy because it's for the death, because they use mostly formaldehyde nowadays and it's un unhealthy for the people who was working like that. So they're interesting to look for what was doing ancient Egyptian 
to find some uh, product for a conservative product which are more healthy to protect uh, the the worker which are using uh, which are produce that so that uh, are interesting technique that we can learn uh, once again with the food um it's it's uh, we know which kind of ingredient they could have and uh, the quantity that they could eat according to the people is difficult nowadays yeah that's interesting, yeah, that's interesting. and also regarding the medicine that was one of the questions I had written down actually about what we can learn about their pharmacology basically because yeah, I, yeah that modern, is mostly the things I think yeah yeah because even modern medicine was for a very long time based on ancient Egypt knowledge right I mean we didn't evolve too much until very recently unless I'm very mistaken but I think the Greek book that was used mm -hmm. to teach medicine still uh, until very recently was actually based on Egyptian knowledge as far as I know. So it's really interesting how, um, so, so from these, so do you combine the knowledge from these books with what you find and then? No, but uh, um, uh, that is uh, something that we plan to do with also um, uh, colleague, uh, Egyptologist colleagues, which are um, also specialists about uh, so this kind of literature, but also all the papyri which are relating to medicine and therapeutic. There is some... Uh, Colleagues for me who was working most intensively on about the translation of such uh, document and to summarize everything. And yes, this idea is to to check what what was used. We would like also to reproduce ourselves. What we call uh, in archaeology, we call that experimental archaeology. Actually, this could be also good for nowadays. It's to reproduce something from the text, analyze them in the same way as uh, our archaeological samples and try to compare the molecular signatures to, to check if we could have similar kind of mixture or if it could uh, be related to something which was identified. But um, actually, it's, uh, it's one of the future projects that I would like also to develop with colleagues, uh, uh, Egyptologist uh, colleagues, um, because, um, yeah, after I have no... Um, so much knowledge about the epistemology in medicine through the time so uh, probably you're right that they, it was used but organ for the pharmacology aspect was it's interesting it's sometimes the important molecular marker that we find in such resins or tars because tars are also important or oils as sometimes uh, molecules close as modern pharmacology which could be organic synthetic uh, molecules uh, which are used for again antiseptic antibacterial sometimes antiviral aspect so it's just because nowadays we focus on some molecules specific, extremely well concentrated, but similar kind of molecules with similar kind of uh, bioactivity properties could be identified in such kind of resin. So um, it's um, yeah for me it's quite uh, logical that uh, during long time it was related. And what is a shame it's uh, in our um, in Europe, but I guess it's the same in US. You we lose uh, a lot of the traditional uh, way uh, and traditional knowledge of such things. Uh, but uh, until uh, the the beginning of the 20th century, there is uh, already some tars, uh, conifer tars, birchbark tars, which were still produced and which are still used in some part in the world, which are used to um, uh, against uh, to for. For, for the treatment of different kind of skis uh, of the when you was hurt uh, when you uh, or again when the animals also were attacked by other wild stuff uh, if you have to um, if you were burned or something like that so there is a thing which could be also nowadays uh, still interesting um, uh, to to re refound let's say. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree. It's really yeah. interesting. And I think, don't you think, I mean, a lot of the reasons why we kind of lost all this knowledge, it's a little bit church related now, like very radical. It was, you know, that, that sent us back to the dark ages, at least in Europe, and we lost a lot of that knowledge. And there's a question I asked for an engineer that was here for a very different field, but 
um, the the so do you think um, using this 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 kind of belief type of knowledge, you know, like I don't know, my great grandmother used to say, you know, eat honey every day and this and that, you know, from these kind of passing down maybe in places that are still kind of traditional that we can maybe um, descend some of these ancient knowledge type of recipes and then would it be interesting to feed that into maybe some machine learning with all the data you collect mm -hmm. like the uh, actually it's, actually it's something also um what the people the um, the anthropologists or the ethnographists um begin to uh, to to document for all the for every kind of knowledge and uh, which uh, especially if they could, can document a traditional society or they use traditional uh, techniques let's say that is something that um, i think they begin to create some database uh, to to keep and to document everything because um, i think we are in the last periods where there is still some traditional societies which are working with traditional knowledge so there's still people in the world who are which are who are working like that which have still this knowledge but um, according to my colleague, which are doing ethnographic studies, something like that, it's more and more old people. In every part in the world, the young generation uh, have other things to do to continue to create uh, old tar, for example, to plant tars or to uh, to document all uh, glue or all um, uh, food practices or all traditional methods. Uh, the new generation everywhere uh, uh, want to to do something uh, to to learn something and. Um, in in Europe, we already learn a lot, so that's why we begin to try to document that. Uh, but uh, it's something really important to do because uh, at the um, the old generation uh, in ten years will uh, will disappear. We will not have any more direct evidence on probably on, on so traditional way for um, it could be for therapeutic properties, but also kind of uh, I think for the food is other things. The food uh, is uh, something which could be transferred easily but um, yeah again some uh, um, some uh, resin transformation some tars uh, uh, production some uh, charcoal production there is a lot of activities some tools production which are not uh, any more uh, interesting uh, for for a lot of people they will disappear soon so that is something that um, Indeed, uh, something with the machine learning I think, has to be in, uh, integrated, documented, and also for us to have uh, access to uh, this knowledge uh, in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah, you, thank you for sharing that. That's really wonderful to know because I could imagine that combining this with these archaeology findings and analysis that you do. Could we maybe point back to when this originated, where it came from, and you know how these ideas and knowledge was passed along? I think mm -hmm. that's because you know back in time, the writing down was probably you know was not so common in population, mm -hmm. and then also it would dissolve. You had to manually um, you know rewrite, uh, copy the text, so. It would be really but we have, for example, for the for the prehistoric society, we have no text anymore, and we know that we have we have lose we have lost some knowledge. Or sometimes the archaeologists try to recreate some tools, uh, so with experimental archaeology, and sometimes they find the way how they could, uh, to reproduce these tools. But sometimes we have no idea anymore. Sometimes we find archaeological objects we are not sure about them their function. Because we lose uh, everything, and if it's not a, uh, also as you say, uh, if it's a society with text, uh, it's not sure that you have the text uh, motion in all these things. If it's prehistoric societies without text, um, it's difficult. Yeah. 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 I imagine. Yeah. I was just thinking some traditions okay. that maybe pass along originated in something that you could say, oh, I found this type of. 
resin here and it makes sense with you yeah. know and some traditional well, for example for this resin for example the elimi and damars um you know the european use that uh, during long time for the painting varnish so but uh, and it was also used in the asia for the for the ship um um i'll say that so the corking but also but if you document it with people we are looking that it's also for several kind of practices and the okay the other first practices are known but also how they are used for the ther therapeutic properties actually it's not uh, it's something that we need to stick to document it nowadays with the population which are still doing that who are still doing that that is an example yeah thank yeah, you so thank much you. this is really exciting and so interesting and yeah i wish we could um spend a lot more time discussing this because i could continue going on <laughs> <laughs> but i know time is limited for everyone so yeah. um thank you so much for coming thank for you not giving up and for sharing this this is so interesting and fascinating and i'm really curious let us know when you publish your next paper i'm really um, okay. interested in reading it thank you so much Thank you and have a good day for you, I guess. Yeah, and good evening for you. And thank you, everyone, <laughs> for the questions. And um, yeah, if you like discussions like this, just check on the calendar, join us again. And Maxime, uh, good luck for everything and really thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. I'll close the room in three, two, one. Bye, everyone. Thank you.